お待たせいたしました。貴重講演を。こんにちは。どうもありがとう。It's an extreme honor to be invited to speak to you today. I am sorry not to be with you in your beautiful country for this wonderful convention. I hope that you can see the slides and hear me.、Uh, Koshimura sensei. Can you see the slides and hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Very good. It's the middle of the night here, so、uh, I'm a little bit sleepy. I'm delighted to be here with you. My last visit to Japan was in autumn of 2019 when it was an extreme honor that Emperor Naruhito. And Empress Masako attended my lecture. But the biggest honor of my life came after the lecture when I was granted an audience and to have tea with them and with my friends, Drs. Hiroko and Akiko Shibanai. That was indeed a wonderful experience, and I very much enjoyed speaking with Emperor Naruhito. And the Empress Masako regarding their pets and my pet. It was interesting that when we sat and talked together about our pets, we had a bond as we have with our pets. So I like that very much. I bring you greetings from Missouri in the United States of America, from the University of Missouri Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital. And the Sinclair School of Nursing at University of Missouri. It was my privilege to work at University of Missouri as a professor、uh, for 22 years. I retired in August of 2019, just before COVID. During my time at University of Missouri, I created the Research Center for Human Animal Interaction. It was a lifelong dream to do such a thing. And、uh, with my wonderful team, we were able to conduct studies of connecting people with pets,、uh, in particular, people in transition.
So we studied US military veterans. We studied prison inmates. We studied families of children with autism, senior citizens, older adults that is, who were living alone. And we not only studied the uh, humans, but we studied the animals as well. So we looked at the stress in shelter cats when they had been adopted by families of children with autism. We looked at the stress in the horses that uh, military veterans were riding in therapeutic horseback riding. So it was a wonderful um, One Health type of research program that continues today in my absence and I'm grateful to have been a part of it. But if we look at One Health, we know that One Health is the idea that the health of people is connected to the health of animals and our shared environment. So when we protect one, we protect all. There is vital symbiosis between people, animals, and the environment. You are all aware that One Health depends on us working together. It involves everyone, it involves veterinarians, agriculture workers, pet owners, healthcare workers, policy makers, epidemiologists, ecologists, scientists from other fields, and laboratory workers. But we all must work together to achieve this wonderful thing known as One Health that is worthy of a convention such as the one we're having today. One Health is important because as the Earth's population grows, our connection with animals and the environment changes. People live closer together. Changes in climate and land use occur. There is more global travel and trade. And animals are more than just a food source. These factors make it easier for disease to spread between animals and people. And our previous speaker uh, discussed uh, the type of transmissions we're talking about very well. So a One Health approach takes on the shared health threats by looking at all angles, humans, animal, plant, and the environment. We must use a One Health perspective toward COVID-19 to study, provide clear and consistent information, and develop collaborative management strategies for this challenging, challenging pandemic. We know that there is a defined scope of One Health. Animal models are uh, key factors in better health for all species. It's easier to study animal models in many ways than it is to study certain disease processes in people. Combating existing and emerging diseases and zoonoses and reverse zoonoses are vital, such as through group housing of animals and exposure to infected people. If we control those factors, we can combat uh, zoonoses and reverse zoonoses. Then application of emerging technologies, for example, sensors, nanotechnology, genetically personalized treatments and vaccines and through diagnostics and therapeutics developed by human trials, which then benefit veterinary patients, that is animal patients. And we know that veterinary patient trials benefit human patients. So the focus is on disease prevention and management. COVID-19 has forced our awareness of other people, animals, and environmental factors. 
There are many uh, characteristics of COVID-19 that lend themselves to a One Health approach. So we'll look a bit at how that happens. Uncertainty has perhaps been the main feature of the COVID-19 experience. We've been left wondering the what, where, who, when, why, and how of COVID-19. And it has raised a number of questions and this uncertainty. So if we look at this diagram, you see on the left side uncertainty. Then we see appraisal, that is, if we see this uh, uncertainty experience as being potentially a benefit or only a danger, our appraisal comes to us to guide us with how we can adapt and cope with forming this new normal, which we hear a lot about. That is that probably COVID is not going away. How will our lives be altered in such a way and how have they been altered in such a way that we have a new normal? Or will we have what the bottom box says that we have anxiety, depression, social isolation, loneliness, and so where will we be going in terms of these uh, challenges? Companion animals present a mediator in our appraisals and our adaptation to COVID-19 lifestyle. They help us to form our new normal. And in the US, older adults with COVID-19 impacted social lives reported that they had more loneliness unless they walked their dog at least once a day. Pet owners over age 65, again in the US, had less social support and loneliness than younger pet owners. And dog owners in China reported less insomnia, that is trouble sleeping, and uncertainty regarding COVID-19 than cat owners. People with more than one pet, though, had lower depression scores. So we can see that animals can fit nicely into this model and help us to reach adaptation and coping. Then if we look at the antecedents to COVID-19, uncertainty included previous ep epidemic uh, experiences the responses of our governments and health authorities in terms of giving understandable and consistent information, organizing resources, distribution of masks and vaccines, and, and then addressing conspiracy theories. So if we look at the picture with the three blue circles, we can see that where we would like to be is coping with the uncertainty and adaptation but that things must be addressed, the questions, the uncertainty must be addressed through multiple factors, and, and certainly conspiracy theories need to be addressed. So people's appraisals of the uncertainty have been framed by raising infection rates, rates increasing numbers of people infected and deaths, challenges to healthcare resources, fear of hospitalization and fear of death or long lasting side effects. Some have turned in this face of this uncertainty to purchasing a puppy for companionship or a kitten. In fact, one study showed that puppy purchases during COVID-19 in UK were based on having more time to care for a dog and that those puppies cost on average uh, 312,000 yen. So that was very expensive. In the US, pet ownership did not increase and unfortunately more pets were rehomed re that is relinquished than in our stable times. During lockdown periods, people found that working from home gave pet owners more time to spend quality time with their pets, 
Dog owners reported socializing with others and walking their dog each day to cope with the isolation of COVID lockdowns. So we know that those lockdowns are associated with loneliness, isolation, social activity, disruption, anxiety, and depression. And what the pets provided in all of this was uh, that people with poorer mental health before lockdown were uh, more likely to have a stronger bond than with their animal than those with better mental health. But that pet ownership was in some instances linked to mental health decline during the lockdown. That dog owners walked um, their dogs shorter periods, but the dogs were playing more with their dog owners, with their owners, and that dog owners did not think their dogs were bothered by COVID. Now in the US, some pet ownership um, situations were unrelated to well-being and loneliness and engaging physically or socially with dogs did not improve outcomes for the people. If we look at this diagram with the possible outcomes, you see the top green uh, circle indicating perception of opportunity of COVID. And the bottom one is perception of danger. So under the top uh, green dot, we see a uh, new sense of order that is a new normal, new view of life, acceptance, and tolerance. In the bottom green circle connection is we see increased anxiety, depression, and emotional and psychological distress. So we know that we need some new strategies for human-animal interaction. In particular, we need education regarding the risk of zoonoses. When the study came out about the first cat in Switzerland to have uh, 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 acquired COVID from its owner, people began to be very worried about whether their pets could transmit COVID to them and vice versa if they could transmit COVID to their pet. And there is a lack of information and education for people about this concern. So it led to a great deal of uncertainty. Then people who are wanting to adopt a pet during COVID lockdown would particularly have a problem because they may not be able or willing or, or want to go out and access a pet. And they may need have needed assistance doing that that still is the case for people who are immunocompromised and having um, anxiety even now about leaving their home because of COVID numbers of cases. We know that we also need different procedures for animal visitations in hospitals and schools and nursing homes because previously we could just take our animals there and visit the patients who were there. Now we know that things like video visits and video chats may be more beneficial or just as beneficial, although there isn't the possibility to pet and touch the animal, but seeing the animal and seeing antics of the animal and play can be beneficial for those patients in a virtual way. We also know that we need more mechanisms for veterinary care and pet supplies, delivery of these services need to change to adapt to those who may be fearful to come to the veterinary clinic. In human medicine, we have seen a very large growth in telemedicine, that's telehealth. And it's important that veterinarians begin doing telemedicine visits through Zoom, through phone uh, networks to help their clients seek out their care advice and information regarding the health of their animal. Given that this is the year of the tiger, we need the strength 
resolve, diligence, and persistence that the tiger has if we are going to adapt and develop these new normals for people, animals, and the environment. We need to have our ikigai in place. That is the Japanese secret for a long, happy, and successful life. A reason to get up in the morning, a reason for being or a path to lifetime fulfillment. It's the art of finding purpose in our life. And COVID presents challenges and opportunities that can be addressed if we have our ikigai clearly in, in mind in our awareness. We know that pets can stimulate physical activity and thus pets can be part of our ikigai. We know that dog ownership has been found to be protective against stress and depression and to encourage a routine for owners. So it may be beneficial in forming an ikigai. And we know, unfortunately, that there is a disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on vulnerable populations. The poorest countries have fewer resources for masks, for uh, vaccinations, for vaccines, and that one health disparity in disease transmission exposure, susceptibility, and expression is, is alive and well and occurring. And I'd like to give an example of a very strong ikigai in a facility that we in, uh, created at University of Missouri. It's called Tiger Place. And it is a retirement residence where people move in with their pet. Pets are not only accepted, they are welcomed and greeted and a range of services is provided for the person and their pet. So we have the uh, veterinary practice office in the building. We currently use it by the veterinary medical school and students but it doesn't have to be that way. It could be just a regular veterinary medical practice. But in our case at Tiger Place, we have pet care assistants who will go in, have access to help knock on the door of the person's apartment and help to empty the cat box, help to carry in the food, heavy bags of dog food, help to walk the dog if the older adult is feeling unable to at that moment, and generally provide a great deal of support for the animal, but also for the caregiving of the animal and to support the human animal bond in the residents of Tiger Place who have pets. Uh, one wonderful feature is that even those who don't have pets at Tiger Place know the pets and learn to be friends with the people who have pets. So the animals provide the social lubrication, the social lubricant that we know occurs outside of retirement residences. When people walk down the street, they're more likely to respond positively to someone with a dog than someone who is not walking a dog, for instance. And what we have learned from the residents of Tiger Place is that their ikigai is very much based on their animal. They will tell you that their dog or cat is their reason for getting up in the morning and for continuing to walk and for continuing to try to be as healthy and active as humanly possible. So their fulfillment and their path to this meaningful purpose in life has to do with their pet. And at Tiger Place, we are very happy to support that. One of the main criteria for uh, admission to Tiger Place, though, is that the pet must not be uh, person or animal aggressive. So we have uh, a, a temperament screening that is used to be sure. And if the, the animal is aggressive, 
then we would rather that the owner and the animal would, would live somewhere other than Tiger Place. One of the wonderful things that happens at Tiger Place, and I really believe it's because the residents uh, who have pets have their ikigai based on life with their animal, is they stay at a plateau, then they may have a slight health problem of some kind, and then they go on another plateau, and they stay there for a long time, and then another. And the idea is that they live a very long life with small adjustments or adaptations to change in their abilities rather than in a nursing home where they may just usually start here and just keep decline, decline, decline on a steep decline until they pass away. So at Tiger Place, we think that the ikigai of the residents is vital to their survival and their longevity and to their health as well. Successful life includes health and we're happy to have Tiger Place be one uh, that, that really promotes that. Now the question is, can this be replicated? And I say yes, amen, because it is being replicated in Japan. In um, Osaka, for example, there is uh, a, a replication that is appropriate for Japan and for your culture. Uh, and I think it's called Peppy, Peppy Happy Place. And uh, I had the opportunity to visit there during my last trip to your wonderful country. And it was a very exciting thing to see as it is developing, as it was, was coming into being the planning stages to make it work so that it provides the ikigai for the people but also for the pets who live there. So these two pictures that I have on this slide, the hand and paw, really are indicative of the kind of quality of life, the kind of fulfillment, the purposeful life that one can have with a strong bond with a companion animal. And I doubt that I am saying anything to any of you that you don't believe when I say that because generally people who are into One Health are also understand the benefits of human-animal interaction and the human-animal bond. So Tiger Place is one way that University of Missouri has uh, really operationalized um, helping people have their pets and their ikigai. One of the other wonderful things there is that we have a, as a learning laboratory for uh, all students at the university. So law students help older adults with their legal matters. Uh, other physical therapy students help do uh, exercises with the residents. Not only the vet students and the nursing students give administer flu vaccines and they were in, involved in administering the COVID vaccines and boosters. And generally speaking, Tiger Place is a, a vital learning laboratory for students of the university which is something that we happen to have here at University of Missouri, but uh, it doesn't have to be linked up with the university, although that is not a bad idea. So I am happy to share that with you, and I know that Koshimira Sensei is going to ask a question or two about that when we have our Q&A. I'd like to show you my references. You may have them at your disposal. And I would like to show you my child, uh, McCallum, who is also called Callie. She is a five-year-old Gordon setter. And I am presently at uh, South Carolina, where Callie and I have been walking on the beach every morning. And actually, she's been running on the beach so much so that she's tired the rest of the day. 
but we're we're having a little vacation here and hence I had some internet problems so I'm I went to a hotel nearby to uh, to speak to you uh, tonight and I will tell you that um, this is pretty late for me it's now uh, one o'clock in the morning here and I can't remember when I was up until one o'clock in the morning before this <laughs> so I will turn over to Koshimira Sensei to pose questions that we can talk about. Hi, Rebecca Sensei. Professor Johnson, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And uh, despite this being very late for you at night, thank you very much for staying up so long. Now, I would like to ask a few questions to you, if that's okay. And uh, I have actually visited Tiger Place three times so far. And uh, right now in Japan, we're trying to get the power together between public and uh, private sectors. So, Companion Animal Land and also elderly people's facilities uh, built into one facility. This is a plan that we're working on. As you operate Tiger Place, what is most important for you? And what is the most important rule that you apply to Tiger Place? And um, what is the success, key for success for Tiger Place? What is the philosophy of uh, Tiger Place's operation? Yoshi, I think you asked me a question, but it was in Japanese, so I didn't understand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Could you say the question in English, my friend? And by the way, I like your University of Missouri tie. Ah, uh, okay. Well, uh, this is a tie you kindly gave me uh, before. Okay, I'll uh, just uh, repeat uh, our question. Uh, in Japan, uh, right now, some project is going on uh, with the collaboration of uh, government uh, officers as, as well as uh, private sectors, uh, which is uh, the total pet land, including uh, tiger place type uh, facility. Um, I would like to um, ask you, uh, what, what is the uh, success factor of Tiger Place? Or uh, if you are putting um, very important uh, uh, rule for establishing the Tiger Place, uh, please uh, tell us. Uh, anyway, uh, what is the success factor uh, or uh, management uh, philosophy uh, for the successful operation of Tiger Place in the United States? Thank you. That's a very good question. The uh, key factor for Tiger Place's success is that it is a collaboration of multiple disciplines. So we know that older adults are complex people they, they don't get more uh, uh, simpler as they age, they get more complex. So we have a, a good collaboration between medicine and nursing and veterinary medicine and public health. And that is the key to success. Uh, and, and number one, it must be that pets are a vital part of Tiger Place. It has always been a number one factor that pets are important and we want them there because they are good for older people. Uh, Dr. Rebecca? Dr. Rebecca, can you hear me? Yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, you can use a simultaneous interpretation service we have. And uh, yes, um, are you using the uh, PC? Okay, the problem the Zoom to refer so you can find the interpretation icon.
Yeah, I was sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, and they please select the language English, right? Yes, <laughs> from the interpretation icon. Can you hear the interpreter's voice? Testing, yes. testing. This is yes. interpreter speaking. Testing. Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind answer. And uh, in your presentation, you talked about uh, the Japanese word ikigai. ikigai. Now, what is your ikigai right now? Can you please share that with us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can share that with you. My ikigai right now is gratitude. I believe that being grateful for all of the blessings in my life is what gives me the reason to get up in the morning and purposeful life. And of course, I'm very grateful for my dog, uh, but I'm, I have so many blessings. I am very rich with blessings. I always have been. So gratitude is my ikigai. Hi, thank you very much for your answer. Now, HAI, human-animal interaction, when an animal um, comes in contact with human, how much benefit do you think they can enjoy? Do you mean the animal or the human or both? Well, uh, both, but the particularly this time for animals. Well, we know that animals enjoy the same neuroendocrine hormonal changes as humans when we interact with them. Dr. Johannes Odendahl's classic work in South Africa demonstrated that very clearly, and it has been replicated since then. So we know that when we interact with our animal, their heart rate slows their respiratory rate slows, they feel a sense of well-being, relaxation, and warmth, and nurturing, just as we do. And Linda Handlin's dissertation um, it really demonstrated that too, that, that interacting with a brand new baby, the mother and the brand new baby, was very, very similar hormonally when the uh, same person interacted with their dog. So we see that this, this neurohormone connection is very present and it's trans species across species. Which is nice. Oh, very nice. No, I have to go. I must. Yes, very nice. Thank you. No, that's uh, exactly what One Health is all about. Thank you very much for your very kind answer. Now, in AAA, I think there are certain. Um, characteristics or predispositions on the animal side that we're looking for. So what type of animal are we looking for? In AAA or AAT, we are looking for an animal with a calm temperament that is not fearful or aggressive. Of course, we want no aggression, but we want an animal that is receptive to its human and focused on its human handler, but will also interact calmly and positively with the person that's being visited. But you know, COVID has made a major challenge for people doing animal assisted activity and animal assisted therapy. And, and to the point that it's, it has become really a virtual. So kind of a tele, telehealth, tele-AAI process by visiting through Zoom or in the case in the hospitals, it's possible to call in to here in the States and I'm sure in Japan because you're so much more advanced than we are uh, to call into 
uh, the hospital system and get on the video screen and your animal could be seen by, by not just one patient at a time, but by an entire floor, entire unit, entire ward. And that is a very exciting thing. Now, of course, we don't have the human touch of the animal, but we have to be careful that we take care of the welfare of the animal as well as the human in both AAA and AAT. So we don't want the animals getting COVID uh, any more than we want the people getting COVID or anything else that's infectious, potentially damaging. はい、え、ありがとうございます。え、ま、I'm sorry, I didn't hear the translation of that. What is the most important uh, factor when you think about the contribution to uh, One Health when you discuss human-animal interactions? I think the most important factor of uh, human-animal interactions regarding One Health is the fact that it is reciprocal, that it goes both ways between from the human to the animal, the animal to the human. And of course, we mustn't forget the environment. So when we are interacting, for example, with our, our animal, you know, we we have the opportunity to engage with the environment in a positive way. At the same time, we must be responsible pet owners. And if we're outside with our dog or cat and they defecate, we must clean up. You know, so we have a, a responsibility to our environment just as we do with our, with our pet. And I have a friend who walks her cat. Uh, she has a wonderful cat who walks along in front of her off off lead, and and she's very responsible because the cat wants sometimes to go and and get in people's shrubbery and chew things and start tearing things up. She's very careful to go and pick up her cat and prevent it from doing this. But we have in in one health. It's reciprocal, and we know that the circle goes around pets uh, or humans, animals, environment, but it goes around in both ways, which is really quite wonderful. Thank you very much. I belong to uh, my association. Uh, for uh, human animals uh, happiness creation and the I'm in the member of both and the, the Dr. Shibanai, Hiroko Shibanai, who has an office in Akasaka, Tokyo, uh, works with us very closely when it comes to the manners of pet owners when they walk dogs. In Japan, uh, dogs peeing, for example, often done at the uh, electricity poles on the streets, and uh, that can lead to the erosion, corrosion of the material. So in order to avoid that, the pet uh, sheet material should be used, and we prepare the video material uh, to educate uh, pet owners, and that was used in the TV broadcasting program too, and we are creating a new uh, videos too. So as you said, environment is another important element for us really to focus. We are almost running out of time, but in Fukuoka Prefecture, they have a wonderful efforts to promote One Health. And uh, when it comes to One Health in uh, uh, town or community management, I believe there's no 
uh, established one health focused town or city anywhere in Japan yet. And it can be anywhere uh, that can start this project. But uh, when we are to have uh, one health focused town or community like a prefer uh, Fukuoka prefecture, do you have any advice so that they can have a successful one health focused town community in Fukuoka, please? Yes, I think the most important thing I would say is that when the town or city or neighborhood is creating policies, that it's very important that they do consider that just how important companion animals are. Often that is overlooked. And um, for example, in a town where I used to live, they had a dog park that, that had no stimulation at all. It was just essentially a field with a fence around it. And they thought that they had done the right thing. Well, there was no way for people to really interact. It was just, this was not a, a way to promote the, the interaction between the dogs or the humans. So I think the awareness of the importance of pets in almost every aspect of our lives, whether that be having outdoor seating areas and restaurants where uh, pets are allowed to sit with their owners, whether it be encouragement of uh, businesses to have a dog water bowl outside of their business waiting for the, for the animals that are passing by, whether it be just creating opportunities through programming like uh, we have at the end of every swimming season, the people can come with their dog and swim in the pool together, in the public pool. And that's very popular, having a, they have a little party and it's outside, so there aren't the COVID concerns. And so making awareness in every policy decision, how are we taking into account the fact that people love their animals, that people need their animals to be healthy and happy and have their ikigai, you know, that we need to have that focus. And by the way, I, I'm so excited by, you know, that concept that you have, the ikigai, um, that I, I think I'd like to encourage all municipalities and communities in the states to adopt that as the underlining principle, underlying principle for their policy creations. Because what we really ought to be doing is creating a reason to live and a purposeful life. And if we do that, we're going to be facilitating health in people and animals. Thank you very much for such a wonderful suggestion and advice, Dr. Johnson. And thank you very much once again for your wonderful presentation and uh, answers to, to all the questions. Please give a big applause to Dr. Rebecca Johnson. We know that many of you are participating uh, through internet, but uh, please uh, give a big applause in front of your Zoom screen. Thank you very much from all the way from the US. Thank you once again. Johnson, Koshimura, thank you very much. Thank you.